Welcome to Ideas Sunday. It's July 21st, 2019. A Trumbull County farm plants hope for people with mental illnesses, treating minds, bodies, and spirits through the healing power of nature. But to have this community of people around me cheering me on, there's a, a lot to be said for that. As the nation celebrates the golden anniversary of the first human visit to the moon, we look at NASA Glenn's contributions to the space program, then and in our future. It was a challenging time and it felt like the country was coming apart at the seams. The only thing that brought the country together was the space program. Commerce, recreation, and nightlife. It's all happening where the river meets Lake Erie. We take to the water for a look at what's happening at the mouth of the Cuyahoga. Without our ability to move cargo up the river, there's no arsenal metal, there's no steel. Ideas Sunday is next. Brought to you by Westfield. Offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams. Good morning and welcome to Ideas Sunday. I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you for joining us. We begin this Sunday by traveling to a farm in the most rural section of Trumbull County, more than 50 miles east of downtown Cleveland. It sits squarely amid Amish communities and land that's been plowed and tended to for generations. But this specific 300-acre site is dedicated to helping young adults deal with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and other mental illnesses. Hopewell opened in 1996, but odds are you've never heard of it. The people who manage this therapeutic farm community would love to change that. They'd also like to change how America treats those who might seek diagnosis and care at Hopewell. Budding photographer Amanda Wagner has been a Hopewell resident two years. I was in and out of inpatient outpatient hospitals since I was 16 because I was very depressed and I was um, diagnosed with schizoaffective when I was 21 years old and my father passed away so that really just took away my life pretty much. A life she's trying to rebuild while at this tranquil site just a mile outside the hamlet of Mesopotamia, where horse-drawn buggies share two-lane roads with pickup trucks and neighbors are few. There is no typical story about how or why a person winds up at Hopewell, but like Amanda, who's from Texas, many are not in their first residential treatment situation. When I think about the future, I feel scared. Why? Um. Because you don't know what the future holds. It's kind of how I believe it. Amanda knows she is fortunate. Hopewell is one of only five therapeutic farm communities in the United States. Each has its own focus and approach. Hopewell stresses four pillars of treatment. The healing power of nature, meaningful work, participation in a therapeutic community, and clinical engagement including individual and group therapy and adherence to prescribed regimens of psychiatric medications. Medication remains critical. These mental illnesses cause significant challenges and the medications can help. They can, they can put them in a state of mind that allows them to take advantage of what we have to offer here at Hopewell. Watercolor kind of has a little bit of a life of its own. So it's really important to just experiment with it and sort of see what happens. Hopewell's 60 full-time, part-time, and associated clinical staff outnumber the residents, about 30 or so during our visit. Every one of those employees has a special skill set. Program Services Supervisor Jack Childers lives on the farm full-time. He oversees the residents who do much of the daily work here. It's vital to our mission in Hopewell. Without the work crews, we'd be like so many other places. With the work crews, it allows them to take part in meaningful work, not just busy work. They're actually helping the runnings of the, of the farm here. Uh, at the same time, they get to see the results of their work, which I think is very rewarding. Charles there, trimming trees with Jack, arrived just two days ago. Typically, residents stay four to nine months, although some do stay for much longer. A lot of people here, myself included, have been institutionalized prior to being here. Um, and just the whole approach is completely different here more focused on the value of the person, you know, even just expecting us to go to work crews. That means we, A, value the work you put in, and B, we believe you could do it. 
This approach to therapy reflects a detailed and deeply researched strategy, currently overseen by Executive Director Jim Bennett. When we talk to residents today, they have such a sense of well-being about what this place does. How does that happen? I think it's because of the supportive environment that we're absolutely committed to, each and every one of us who are here. The idea that they're here 24-7, the idea that the care is constant, has to be a long way toward healing. I think it is, and uh, another way to describe it is a total change of environment from where they were before, isolated uh, by themselves uh, psychologically. Uh, and often we're feeling alone and not connected with people. And here they are connected all the time. They sleep in the cottages, they dine together, they do work groups together. And so the human fabric is stitched together here to make that healing environment. Most folks who come to us, by the time they've come to us, they've lost all sorts of connections to the community. They've lost the ability to work, they've lost the ability to be in school, they've lost connections at church, they've lost connections family, quite frankly. Work is one of the ways that they get connected to people here at Hopewell. For many of our residents, coming into a facility like this is really just a proverbial breath of fresh air. They've been in and out of treatment facilities, many restricted or locked down units, and a lot of people are tentative about exploring Hopewell because that is precisely the environment they don't want to be in. They're looking for something freeing, something where they can engage in a meaningful community. They're not looking for a restricted environment. They come in, this will sound dramatic, but shattered. They, they come in uh, having spent the last year and a half of their life just not living any kind of a life. And for the most successful, and most people that come here get to some degree of feeling confident that they can go out and live a more independent, rich, full life. Hopewell is very much a working farm. Residents tend large gardens under Cindy Wagner's supervision. What they grow supplies 90% of the vegetables eaten here, and the residents know their contributions matter. When we plant seeds in the garden, um, we watch them grow, just like all of us, you know. We grow. That's the best part about Hopewell. About mid-July, end of July, they start coming up red-faced. Wellness educator Jennifer Miller has turned the crops grown here and the animals raised here into meals for eight years now. She says good nutrition directly impacts mental and physical health, and eating well is part of the treatment. Nutrition is vital in the development of the mind as far as mood, um, memory. So the more whole foods, the more healthy foods that we can give them, the better off they're going to be mentally. There wasn't anything here. There was nothing in close to Cleveland, and there I saw there was a need. The vision of what Hopewell could and should be and the driving force to create this community came from Clara T. Rankin. Now 102 years old and wearing her signature blue hat, she invited me to her garden to talk about Hopewell. I wanted a peaceful place where people could go without feeling stress and where they could work with the earth because I feel that's very important to be able to put your hands in the soil. And I think that working with something like that is very healing. But is there more than anecdotal evidence that this emotional healing manifested through hard work and service actually helps? Dr. Martha Schenagel of University Hospitals crunches the numbers from Hopewell and follows its alumni. I've continued to follow and work with a handful of people after they've left Hopewell. And I can tell you that, they, I mean, they do great. The people that I've seen do great. Um, and it's, it's not like instantly they come out and you know everything's good. There's, the first year is, is a big adjustment and, and hard work to get sort of settled into life outside of Hopewell and to find their way. But they learn the tools and the skills while they're at Hopewell. She says about 50% go back to live with their families. About 20 to 30% end up in group homes. The rest often live independently. 21-year-old Abby Taylor will soon be among those alumni. She's been a resident for about 13 weeks, but will shortly return to Claremont County in southwestern Ohio. She was accustomed to residential treatment, but not to farming, and has loved being among so many animals. It made completing her rehabilitation for depression, anxiety, and PTSD at Hopewell feel more like home. Even if you don't love animals, like there's 200 acres of woods out there, there's a big emphasis on being out in nature here. And I think that's definitely really important. So 
there's a lot of that. I think it's very therapeutic just to, you know, being trying to look for the little things and there are so many little things to appreciate in nature, like, you know, just even the little chicks we have over here. They're so cute. Caring for cute chicks, 300 pound pigs, cows, and horses isn't the only non-standard therapy here. Mary Cassidy runs Hopewell's art program. She loves having the artist create while outdoors, which Cassidy says helps residents express themselves creatively. I explain that to folks as sort of having an, a conversation with your unconsciousness. So it gives you an ability to maybe learn a little bit more about, about yourself, maybe build some insight or awareness into some things that are happening in the moment while you're in recovery and, and while you're going through this oftentimes challenging and difficult healing journey to have a way to just kind of get it out. An artist who's already transitioned is Sam Silverman, who left Hopewell five years ago. He says the months spent there made a huge difference in his artwork and in his life. My artwork is mostly music based because I have something called synesthesia, which means that I see sounds and I hear shapes and colors. I was struggling with mental illness. I was wandering a lot, just doing the chores on the farm, feeding the animals, collecting maple syrup, just walking in the woods, in nature. I mean, these are things that really heal a person. And I think that other facilities may not be like that. Like a hospital wouldn't enable you to be out in nature and to feel so free and, and good. If the idea is to feel free and good, why not interject some rock and roll into the mix? Yes, it's a cover band playing Tom Petty songs. Called Musical Journey, its rotating cast of musicians includes mostly residents. But on guitar is Jim Miller, band leader and another Hopewell therapist. He says his players bond and learn responsibility from behind their drums, keyboards, and other instruments. Music, I think, is the greatest therapy. Number one, you forget all your troubles while you're working on it. You have to concentrate and work on, your, on the music. So not only is the time spent, maybe the three months we spend working, a process that is in many ways spiritual and in many ways healing, but it's a great sense of accomplishment for everybody. The surprise ending. <laughs> that sense of accomplishment is not always shared by insurance companies. Months of intensive residential care that can carry a price tag of hundreds of thousands of dollars is not cost effective in their eyes. Limited or even non-existent reimbursements have kept the number of people who could benefit from Hopewell's program well below its capacity. Residential treatment in general costs between ten and sixty thousand dollars a month. Hopewell officials say its costs are toward the lower end of that scale and that most residents rely on their own resources, along with limited insurance benefits. And the farm does work with some families to help subsidize some costs. The impact that places like ours are going to be able to make is going to be constrained unless and until insurers and government funding start to realize that if you want to make people, if you want to help people be independent and recover from mental illness, you cannot do it through short stays in institutions. Would you like to see the Hopewell model expand across the states? I think there's a big need. I think it would be good if somebody could do it. Each place that in the group of five that we know about that are similar does it in a slightly different way. So who knows if they would ever call it a model for them to, to do that, but this has been thought about quite a bit, I think, at Hopewell in the board discussions. Mental health is a, a journey that involves a lot of people, but at the end of the day, it's work that I have to do myself and that I have to hold myself accountable for. But to have this community of people around me cheering me on and, you know, who are there when I ask questions or I'm having a bad day, there's a, a lot to be said for that support to be, yes, this is in a lot of ways a journey that I have to take myself, but I'm never truly alone. You know, there are always people on the sidelines cheering me on and, and helping me.
50 years ago this weekend, three Americans, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Ohio native Neil Armstrong, accomplished one of the greatest technological feats in history, landing safely on the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin, of course, actually set foot on the lunar surface, while Collins remained in orbit, ready to rendezvous with the spacecraft dubbed Eagle and complete the final phase of the mission, returning safely to Earth. We'll read the flag that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Air men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon. July 1969. Millions worldwide watched them take that giant leap. The Apollo 11 flight culminated decades of work by scientists, engineers, and test pilots around the country, many of them at Cleveland's NASA Lewis Research Center, later renamed for another Ohio astronaut, John Glenn. Last week, my colleague Mike McIntyre and the Sound of Ideas team set up shop about a mile north of here at the Great Lakes Science Center for a community conversation on our region's contributions to space exploration and the enormous lasting impact of Neil Armstrong's one small step. When President Kennedy declared that we were going to go to the moon, he was talking about something that we had not yet invented. We did not have spacesuits, spacecraft, rockets that were capable. Our, the extent of our time in space was about 15 minutes. 15 minutes. The Soviets had put an, a, a cosmonaut into orbit. The United States, the best that we could do at that time, our rocket wasn't even strong enough to put a, a human into orbit. So it was just a short 15-minute flight. And now we're going to go all the way to the moon. It is amazing. In fact, it's awe-inspiring that we were actually able to do that. And we had to develop the technology along the way. We did not have any of these things in place. So we were working from scratch. It, correct me if I'm wrong, this was all brand new territory that we're talking about. You talked about the time period, the history that was going on at the time. And being a kid growing up during that time, I remember all of those things. I can remember the fear of the Russians, the, the fear that we might be involved in a nuclear blast and learning to drill how to protect ourselves in the event of nuclear war. We had war going on overseas. There was political unrest at home. We had, um, we had assassinations. We had fights for rights for women, for African Americans, uh, for gay and lesbians. It was a it was a challenging time and it felt like the country was coming apart at the seams. The only thing, the only thing that brought the country together, from my memory, was the space program. And it was a progression. So I think we always think that you just lit this large rocket and we went off to the moon. But go back and read it. You know, you started with some very early rocketry and then you went through the Mercury program. And could that actually work? And then Gemini, you know, Gemini people forget that those are some very challenging orbital mechanics problems that had to be solved. And then even with Apollo, it wasn't, okay, now we're going to the moon. It was a whole series. And when you look at the actual missions of Apollo, and each one of them was an incremental technological step before we actually landed. Some was orbiting the moon. Others was trying to get the lunar lander out and put that all together. Even the mission before uh, Apollo, uh, Apollo 10, the lander was active. We were very close to the surface of the moon, but did not take the last step. It was a very incremental progression, and so I think the nation sort of followed that, right? It was a emerging story at the same time we had all of this other thing going on. So all the bad news was on the television around you, but then this story came in, and slowly we made that progress over time. Absolutely. In and fact, we, with Apollo 11. we couldn't right. step forward without completing each one of those right. steps. But it was a they, story was that, that pulled important. us in, yes. But, but Ian, let, let me ask you this, though. It took a lot of brain power and a lot of elbow grease and a lot of money, but how much did national will play into this equation and the idea that it was a race, that it was the Soviets and we needed to win? Yeah, well, I guess that's one, another thing you can kind of uh, credit Lewis with was that kind of bold vision for going to the moon. Uh, when Apollo was planned, the initial goal was just to go to the moon and just kind of hang out, take some pictures, and come back. Uh, but when they were planning, there was you know another Lewis person who had gone to headquarters and you know for the planning of these missions, and he his name was George Lowe. And he was, you know, let's land on the moon. That would, you know, we could, we could do this. And you know, um, they said, go ahead and go ahead and study that. We're we're not going to pursue that at this moment. But 
uh, with the space race and those continuing losses to the Russians and President Kennedy's like, what can we do? What is left? What is feasible for us to to beat the Soviets is something we need to up the ante. And you know, George Lowe's got his fancy report, like, well, by the way, it is totally possible for us to land on the moon and this is how we do it. I think a lot of the folklore around the Apollo program is that you know, President Kennedy came up with this idea of landing on the moon and he you know, said, we will go to the moon because it is hot. And, that, and then NASA was like, hey, that sounds cool, let's do that. But it was you know, bef you know, a lot of planning ahead of time and you know, something that can be credited to another one of those Lewis uh, leaders. We'll have more from our community tour conversation later in the program, including a look at NASA Glenn's role in future space missions. Now, perhaps no place is commemorating this weekend's anniversary with more pride than Wapakoneta, Ohio, astronaut Neil Armstrong's hometown. 50 years, a man on the moon. 50 years ago, you'd never seen anything or thought of that. We would put a man on the moon for a while, and we did. And it happened to be our man from Wapakoneta, Ohio, Neil Armstrong. Ahead of the golden anniversary of his One Small Step, we traveled to the Aglaes County seat to learn more about the late astronaut's roots and to see what's transpired since his vault onto the lunar surface. For more on the town that went to the moon, including photos and interviews with Armstrong's boyhood friends, go to ideastream.org. A few blocks from Shaker Square, you'll find a district of quirky shops, fine restaurants, and hospitable neighbors. Stakeholders in the area they call Larchmere, named for its main street, know they're not the trendiest or the most upscale neighborhood in town, but they trumpet their community's upbeat vitality and offbeat charm. IdeaStream's Gabriel Kramer takes us for a visit. Let's be honest here. This band is great, but to see it rocking the house Literally, a house is kind of strange. This front porch performance is part of the charm of Larchmere, an east side enclave in Cleveland's Buckeye Shaker neighborhood. One weekend a year, Larchmere residents welcome bands to their homes for the annual Porch Fest. Larchmere hosts many events and festivals in the summer. That's part of its identity. It mirrors the spirit of the neighbors who like to keep things fun. I was looking for a place that had spunk character, independent zest, and individual spirit. Harriet Logan owns Logan Berry Books, a floor-to-ceiling filled bookstore that embodies that spunk. Logan opened the store in 1994 admiring Larchmere's tradition of independently owned businesses. The funny thing about Larchmere is we always seem to be on the cusp. We are the next best neighborhood to watch, but we've never quite rounded that curve, and we've never fallen off that curve into past its prime. Logan belongs to the Larchmere Merchants Association, a business group dedicated to marketing and improving the community. In a time of online stores and ebooks, Logan Berry Books remains a Larchmere staple 25 years after opening its doors. There's enormous effort to know your customers by name and to give them what they want and to build a community that is important to the people in the community so that they come back. This is the friendliest neighborhood ever. Susan Telecki has lived on East 130th and Larchmere her entire life. My mother grew up here. I grew up here. My three children grew up here. Strolling through Larchmere, you see a lot of big, grand gardens, like the Teleckis. I was the first one I started it. I didn't tell them to follow me. <laughs> Teleki has seen lots of change in her time. Storefronts and restaurants came and went and came back. This whole half had no plants on it. But to Teleki, the one constant has been the spirit of the Larchmere neighbors, who foster that sense of community. We like this neighborhood. We don't want to see it not be safe. So people got together and created change. It takes people to care that want to put the effort into making the change. We're here because we care. And when we have the opportunity to welcome someone new into that fold, we're more than happy to. As a millennial Cleveland transplant, Peter Zahersky chose the Larchmere neighborhood over others that may seem trendier to his peers. 
unlike some of the neighborhoods in Cleveland that you know people move to just because they're cool, I think people who come to this neighborhood are here for more than that. Zahersky grew up in Steubenville, but visited his Aunt Mary in Larchmere as a kid. He now owns his Aunt Mary's old house. There's a sense that you're part of a revitalization of a neighborhood. Um, there's just a sense that you are, you're in it with everyone else. I have people that I call friends in this neighborhood who are in their 70s and 80s, but we still can hang out, we can have a great conversation, and it's good when you're engaging with people who aren't just like you, aren't just your age or your color. The diversity that was large to me was really, is, is really, really beautiful. They're very welcoming. Carla Batista doesn't live in Larchmere, but her house-turned-Brazilian restaurant, Batuki, is one of Larchmere's biggest visitor attractions. All restaurant fits really well. Batista is a Larchmere advocate. When those visitors come to dine al fresco in her front yard, she encourages them to check out all of the other restaurants and storefronts too. The neighborhood is really amazing and welcome to Latchmere. It's a great community and I tell everybody we have it going on. The boundaries of Larchmere vary depending on who you ask, but most describe it as the area that sits just north of Shaker Square and stretches from MLK Boulevard to Moreland Boulevard where Cleveland and Shaker Heights meet. Blaine Griffin represents Larchmere in Cleveland's 6th Ward on City Council. He's also a Larchmere resident. Griffin says his constituents in surrounding areas, like Buckeye and Woodland Hills, sometimes envy Larchmere's activity and development. Griffin wants to break that divide. You can't look out your backyard and see somebody living in a, in a plush, pristine situation and not want the same thing for your backyard. So we have to join together with our struggles and with the challenges that we have and address them collectively. While these neighbors are proud of Larchmere, they all know it has challenges. Like any urban area, crime is sometimes an issue. And there is a lingering perception that the schools are not as desirable as they used to be or don't measure up to the nearby suburbs. Both can be barriers to attracting residents. But the stakeholders here insist they are committed to overcoming those challenges. You have good days and bad days in this neighborhood, but one of the things that you have in this neighborhood is you have a group of people that persevere. There was a huge preservationist movement to keep the street quirky and independently owned. And it's got that real Cleveland feel of, you know, a hardworking, neighborhood uh, where people care about each other and they look out for each other. You're watching Ideas Sunday. Thanks for spending part of your morning with us. Still to come, the musical Come From Away details events in the small Canadian town of Gander, Newfoundland after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. The U.S. had closed its airspace, forcing thousands of international travelers to land there. We'll meet one of the pilots portrayed in the production. But first, from headwaters to mouth, we've traveled the length of the Cuyahoga River this spring and summer as part of IdeaStream's coverage of the 50-year anniversary of the last fire on the Crooked River. As producer Kevin Morrissey and I discovered during our journey, the Cuyahoga is not only far cleaner, but it's more diverse, more useful, and far more appreciated than it once was. In this third and final segment, one more time, let's go down the river.
Those pictures, that history, and the rampant abuse of this river that was so commonplace back then, horrific. Yeah, it's our legacy. But it's also a launch point because it was those images that spurred Cleveland from Mayor Carl Stokes on forward to do better. This change of attitudes, this renaissance of reputation for Cleveland, really began with this river. And while, of course, geographically the Cuyahoga ends at Lake Erie, when it comes to business, the lake is really where the Cuyahoga begins. Now, it takes a group of organizations overseeing safety and commerce to continue that smooth operation. Most of it runs through the Port of Cleveland. We took an inside look at the port with Will Friedman and Jared Major. When the ships come in, they'll dock here. The, the products will come off either in containers or if it's steel, they'll come off in the coils. They'll unload them onto the docks. So Jared, what's going on here? Ships come along the dock here. They'll dock and they'll hydraulically pump the, the cement powder in, filling the silos. So once the silos are full, You'll see a steady stream of truck traffic or rail traffic going beneath and then it drops the cement into there and then it goes to construction sites. Why do we have these 30 ton rolls of steel here? Well, this, this is the steel that would come off the vessels when they come in. Um, they're placed here and when the customer calls and they're ready to receive the order, uh, they'll be placed on either trucks or rail car and shipped to the customer. All these will go to steel service centers, processors around here. They'll probably end up eventually in cars or appliances or batteries or tin cans. This is, a, for example, a, a steel coil coming out of Germany and it's going to go to a local food packaging company that may make it into a, a tin can. But this is a good vantage point from you know to see all 100 plus acres. Yeah, and it's it's neat to see how it relative to downtown. There are over 20,000 jobs and three and a half billion dollars worth of economic activity tied to the harbor, to the port, and to the shipping up and down the Cuyahoga River, which feeds some of our largest industries. Who okay. uses the port, uses the river? The largest uh, of all would be the ArcelorMittal steel mill. Iron ore flows up the river, as well as other raw materials, the primary ingredients for making steel. They make steel from scratch uh, at that mill. There are a lot of people who don't even know about the LCA, what you do, what you are. Explain that to folks. Well, Lake Carris has been around since the 1880s. We're the oldest trade association in the United States. We represent exclusively U.S. flagships operating on the Great Lakes. Without our ability to move cargo up the river, there's no arsenal of metal, there's no steel in Cleveland. Keep in mind, it's not just steel, though. It's uh, cement, it's stone, it's uh, fuel products. It, it's what makes salt exportable from Cleveland. The Cuyahoga River really is an artery I know you have 1,000-foot vessels. They can't use the Cuyahoga. Is that a detriment to Cleveland that we're stuck with 700-foot vessels? Steel mill is up the river. Um, if you were to do that today, you'd build a steel mill down at the mouth of the river so you could get those 1,000-foot uh, freighters there. That's what we're doing in Chicago and in Indiana Harbor. People don't realize that it takes a captain hours and hours to navigate what's really just five and a half, six miles. Yeah, it's, a, it's about a four-hour trip each way. Uh, and then we have to load and unload. And I'm always amazed at the skill of the sailors going up and down this river. Carrying iron ore to the plants or steel from the plants or cement or anything else along the turns on the river present just one type of challenge to be navigated. Just as important to the users of the water is teamwork off the water. Whether it's the local governments, the port, the LCA, or the Army Corps of Engineers, they must work as a unit to keep the channel operational. A big part of what we do at the port is uh, we work with the Army Corps of Engineers, federal agency that has responsibility for dredging. Uh, Cuyahoga River is actually what we call a federal channel. So it's a federal asset all the way up to the head of navigation at the steel mill about five and a half miles upriver. And so every year the Army Corps has the responsibility to dredge and then we work with the Army Corps 
on what do you do with all that material. We want to dredge that part of the channel to allow commerce to continue. So if we were not to dredge annually the material out of the basically the confluence of the Cuyahoga and Lake Erie, that it would just continue to build up over time and that would impede traffic such as uh, the still barges moving down from actually conducting business and they would not be able to make it down to the plants that need that material to continue to uh, produce still. If you were to envision the queue as a bowl, it would, it would fill up nearly the entire queue with sediment every year. That's how much uh, material is coming, coming down river and has to be dredged by the Army Corps. Something else that would really damage commerce is if we have a slide into the water. So the Corps is certainly integral in making sure that our shores stay on the shore. Very much so, yes. We, we work really hard with our stakeholders and all the different uh, federal and state agencies to maintain the river. We're part of the conversation particularly because we're concerned about it. If, the, if there's a collapse, and we had, had a bank collapse in Detroit several years ago, um, we're out of business. We have teams of people within our division thinking about what's going on and what we need to do to prevent any issues, like you say, in type of slides from occurring. Irishtown Bend is going to need roughly 50 million, probably about 30 million just to build we call bulkheading, that's kind of the foundational wall at the base of the hillside so it doesn't slide. Part of our challenge is to make sure that the recreational boaters understand the risks that they encounter when they try and cut in front of a lake freighter at the last minute. Or some people amazingly will actually try and get close enough to touch the freighter. Um, not understanding that there's a bow prop there, that there's a stern, they're literally risking their, their lives um, for the sake of a selfie. Selfies aside, there really are more people using the Cuyahoga River than ever before. Sport and recreation combining and competing with industry and commerce. Did you know, for instance, that Cleveland is one of the top 10 rowing spots anywhere in the nation? And this stretch of the Cuyahoga River is sought after. Rowers come here from around the country. So advanced is that rowing community that we now host two separate houses. Cleveland Rowing Foundation is one of those. It's home to high school, college, and adult rowing teams. Heads up! Heads up! Uh, trying to row on this river doesn't seem possible uh, because most people are rowing on a very straight river. You know, when you compare to Boston rowing, uh, a lot of rowers can go out, they can have a pretty um, casual row. Uh, you come to Cleveland and you have freighters, tugs, uh, other pleasure boats to deal with, so uh, every practice is unique in its own individual way. Both boats. Both boats, less than a minute to go. Once you get through Columbus Road Bridge, paddle it out. Most of the uh, rivers you go to, they stay on the right-hand side and off you go. Here, you have to go through a whole safety training. We have uh, marine radios. We're in contact with the bridges and the freighters. But we're able to show the country that you can row out here and coexist with all, this, uh, all the other people using the river. Your team, you have a lot of faith in her? She's the captain? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So tell me about the responsibility of, you know, because their, their lives are kind of in your hands when you're out there. Yes, the coach is out there in another boat, but you're out there, you know, against dangers. So I have to make sure that they're all paying attention and make sure their oars are nice and level because no one wants to end up in this water. My responsibility is to make sure that they're all paying attention and then they're doing what their job is to make the boat go faster. One of the things we've been concerned about is the river water quality. There are days where there's high bacteria, high E. coli, or debris. Does that affect you in a way when you're trying to teach and there's times you can't go out there? Not, not so much. It's, it's nice to be able to row on a river that's clean, cleaner. The only thing that really affects us more is uh, when it rains a lot, the speed of the river or if there's a lot of debris in the river, that will keep us off the water. People hear the phrase bathtubs when we were looking at the steel structures on the side. Explain for us how that makes the river 
better river and better for rowing. Yeah, it's unique. Uh, so throughout most of the river, uh, you have bulkhead. Uh, so for rowing purposes, it actually cuts down on the wind. Uh, the water remains a little more flat uh, for the rowers to be able to perform the sport a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing, amazing river to be on. It offers a ton of opportunities to come down for recreation, for rowing community, for athletes to come down to continue something that they have cherished and they've grown to love over the years. Thousands of people plan to gather in Cleveland tomorrow to mark the 50th anniversary of a fire that sparked a nationwide environmental movement. Besides the love of being on the water, Clevelanders have a newly rediscovered love of being around the water. This once nearly abandoned east bank of the flats is now every bit as revitalized as the river itself. New and refurbished apartment buildings line Old River Road, offering 24-7 views of the waterway. Nearly two dozen dining and entertainment options have opened, many with outdoor riverside patios. The Aloft Hotel boasts world-class accommodations for flats visitors. The six-year-old Ernst & Young Tower offers nearly a half million square feet of office space. And on the west bank of the Cuyahoga, Shooters offers a place where boaters can tie up while they grab dinner. For music fans of any genre, Jacob's Pavilion at Nautica helps keep the beat from Casey Musgraves to Alice Cooper. In all, there are 14 more outdoor shows scheduled at the water's edge before Labor Day. And to learn about the life in the river, the 70,000 square foot Greater Cleveland Aquarium sits just yards off the Cuyahoga. And what neighborhood is complete without a farmer's market? The Flats now offers that as well. But the Cuyahoga now stands poised for its next 50 years to be its best 50 years. Business and recreation, housing and amenities, all sharing the water down the river. Fifty years after the first lunar landing, Americans are looking to the next moon mission, called Artemis, slated for 2024. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine says the Artemis mission will send the first woman and the next man to the moon's South Pole. The program aims to establish a sustainable human presence on the moon by 2028, a stepping stone to the eventual goal of sending humans to Mars. We discussed future space exploration with panelists during our community tour stop at the Great Lakes Science Center, including the role NASA Glenn plays in helping humans go back to the moon and beyond. NASA Glenn uh, was right there for the first footstep on the moon, um, and we're going to be leading the way for the, for the return. Uh, the architecture, uh, we call it architecture, the way we're going to go back to the moon is different this time than when we went with Apollo, and it's much more robust. It will enable things like we use this word sustainability a lot, um, a sustainable presence, but also we're just going to be able to get to more parts of the moon with this new architecture. A key part of the new architecture is um, an orbiting platform called Gateway that will orbit the moon, and uh, it'll be initially made up of two different parts of a spacecraft, but the first one is the power and propulsion, power and propulsion element. Um, that's what I manage, and that's being led right here at NASA Glenn. It is a spacecraft that is essentially a very high power solar electric propulsion spacecraft, just like in Apollo. Um, NASA Glenn, NASA Lewis then, uh, led this charge for an alternate way to think about propulsion as we brought hydrogen uh, to the discussion. Um, bringing solar electric propulsion uh, is a different propulsion technology, has been used in some commercial applications in space, other deep space uh, science type missions, but this will be the first time that it's used for human exploration, um, and it's, it's a game changer. It will allow us to reach the entire surface of the moon, uh, North Pole to South Pole with the landers. Uh, it will allow us to have a, a sustained presence there for on the order of 15 years. Uh, if we want, which allows us to complete the moon missions as well as start the uh, aggregation or the accumulation of the spacecraft that could then lead to Mars. Nicole, none of this happens. Orion goes nowhere until you give it a green check mark. That's right. Um, in a couple of months, the Artemis One vehicle, um, the crew module and the service module will be out at our test facility at Plumbrook Station. 
where we have the world's largest, most powerful space environmental test facility. Um, we'll be spending about two months in a thermal vacuum chamber with it where we pump all the air out and we hit it with the cold and hot that it would see in space. Really, really cold when it's in the shade, so about minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit in our facility, um, and then up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit um, when it's in the sun. Make sure all the systems still work. Um, we'll do a bunch of different tests functionally on the spacecraft while it's in that uh, configuration with the really cold and the really warm. Um, and we'll check everything out. Then once we're done with that test successfully, we'll do a little reconfiguration and do um, an electromagnetic test on it to make sure that all the radio frequencies that are on, uh, caused by electronic equipment on the spacecraft work together as well as it won't be affected adversely by other radio frequencies that it would see on launch. So yeah, once we give it the thumbs up, we'll send it back down to the Cape and it'll get stacked on the rocket and sent to the moon. You've got the thermal vacuum chamber, but you also have the world's most powerful spacecraft shaker table That's right. and acoustic test facility. So will, will you also be shaking it up? We're not going to be shaking this one. Um, we've shaken some other modules for Orion. This is our fifth test that we've done for major subsystems or modules. Um, so we're feeling really good about that. I'm curious about how the the spacecraft will get to your facility. So apparently it's coming into Mansfield and then, will I see it just riding down the highway on the way to Perkins? <laughs> You might, <laughs> if you can figure out which way it is. Um, yeah, it flies in on the Super Guppy aircraft, which is owned by NASA, and it's based out of Johnson Space Center. If you've never seen that thing take off or land, it's like looking like a, it's like a big whale. Um, you just think, how does that thing fly? Um, but it'll, it'll fly into Mansfield. Um, we'll pull it off there using a tonner and lift it with a really large crane put it on a really large truck, and I've spent about two years moving power lines, which as an aerospace engineer is not something I ever thought would be in my job description, but I've been managing the route prep for that, so we have to be able to get it up to us, 40 miles. Following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, the Federal Aviation Administration shut down all U.S. airspace, forcing more than 4,000 planes to land at their nearest airports. Thousands of international travelers were diverted to Gander, Newfoundland, a small island town on the far eastern tip of Canada. Its population, 10,000. 38 planes carrying more than 6,500 passengers and crew landed in Gander. The events that followed inspired the Tony-winning musical Come From Away, on stage now at Playhouse Square. Ideastream's Dan Paletta spoke with one of the real-life heroes portrayed in the show, American Airlines pilot Beverly Bass. I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't want to fly airplanes. So your first paid flying job, you transported what some might consider some unusual cargo. I did. I only got the job because the guys didn't want to do it and I actually flew bodies for a mortician, and it was in a very small bonanza, you know, four-seat airplane, and I couldn't fit a casket in, so the body was on a stretcher, and it was right beside me, and I had to climb over their face to get to my seat. <laughs> you eventually become the third female pilot for American Airlines and the first captain. What was probably the biggest obstacle that you had to overcome? That wasn't females, just women didn't fly planes back then. Right, it wasn't real normal. Uh, when I got hired by American, I joined a very small group of 14 other women who flew for the U.S. Airlines, so we were uh, quite an elite group at that time. And uh, I must say, getting my jobs prior to American, I uh, noticed discrimination a lot more than you know being with the airlines. American treated me beautifully, and uh, like you said, I was the third female pilot in 76 to be hired by them, and then 10 years later, I became the first female captain. So one of your big challenges comes on 9-11, September 11, 2001. You're flying from Paris to Dallas. 
and you find out about the terrorist attacks. How did you first hear about them? Well, we were right over the middle of the North Atlantic, and we have to monitor air-to-air -air radio frequencies. And so one of the airplanes ahead of us uh, reported on that frequency that one of the towers had been hit. And then about 20 minutes later, they said the second tower had been hit by an airplane. And with that came the word terrorism. So that's how we learned about it. Were you able to process that? I know you're busy flying a plane. What were you thinking as you heard that? No, I didn't even know what they meant. I didn't know what terrorism meant. I thought that was something that happened somewhere else in the world, certainly not on U.S. soil. And it, it, we just couldn't even process the fact that the it, airliners hit the towers. I mean, you just couldn't even imagine that. So I'm curious, did that in any way affect your desire or want to fly? Did you have any fear about that? I know pilots don't have much fear, but did you think, I don't know if I want to keep doing this? Oh, no. I flew for seven years after 9-11, and even when I got home after the tragedy, I begged to go right back to work because I was never going to let those guys ruin what I loved so much. So that five days is spent. You, your plane is diverted to this small town in Newfoundland. Where do they take you, and what did you see as you, as you start to land? Well, uh, the town has a population of 9,400 people. We were nearly 7,000 passengers and crew. Uh, we were 38 wide bodies that landed in a three-hour time frame. And I was number 36 to land, so when I'm on final approach, I'm looking out, and all I can see are airplanes, wide bodies parked all over the taxiways and the runways that we're not using and the terminal ramp area. It was an incredible sight. And then there were cars lining the highways everywhere because it, it really looked like everybody in Newfoundland had come to the airport to see what had happened because they had never had that many airplanes on the ground in Gander at one time since World War II. So you're now in the town of Gander and you're there for several days and the community rallies around you like it's almost hard to believe. It was absolutely amazing. And I pretty much stayed at the Comfort Inn the whole time because we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have pagers, and I never knew when I was going to get the call to go back to the airport. So I needed to stay close to a phone. However, after I saw the musical for the first time come from away, that is when I learned about so many of the other events that had occurred and the way that people were treated. I knew that we were treated beautifully. There wasn't anything that we wanted or needed that they didn't get right away. And when we got off the airplanes, you know, the terminal was just lined with tables of food. I mean, it told me they had been up all night cooking because we got off the airplane at 7.30 in the morning on September 12th. We were on the airplane 28 hours before we got off. So 10 years later, 2011, you go for a 10-year commemoration of what had happened in Gander and how they helped you, and you meet the people who write the musical. Did you think to yourself, this would be a good idea for a musical? Oh, my heavens. I couldn't even imagine such a thing. I didn't even know how a musical is written. And when they did the interview, it lasted four hours. All the other interviews were like five-second sound bites for the evening news, and you know, so it was really quick. But we left after that, went back home, and four years later, we got a call from the producers inviting us to the world premiere opening of the musical that those playwrights wrote, and we didn't even know what we were going to see. So you've seen this hit musical come from away a number of times. How does it, do you feel like it's part of your life now? It absolutely is. It has just consumed our lives, but in such a wonderful way, we've had the opportunity to do so many things and participate in so many events, and it, it, it's just been life-changing. I've seen it now 128 times, and my husband has seen it 126 times. So we love it, we never get tired of it, and we know all the cast members, and it's just, it's, it's part of our life. Let's talk about the title, Come From Away. What does that mean? It is a hard name to remember, and it gets called everything but come from away. And the way it gets its name is if you were not born in Newfoundland, you have come from away. So they referred to us as come from away, the passengers on the plane. So that's how it got its name. There's a Beverly Bass character that's a composite of you and some other pilots, but there is a piece called Me in the Sky that really is about you. What is that song about? That song is 
four minutes and 19 seconds. It literally chronicles my aviation life. I had no idea the song had been written until I heard it the first time on stage. And you can literally take paragraphs out of the transcript of the interview that I did with David and Irene, and it's in the song. So I just, I love it. It's a beautiful song. They said girls shouldn't be in the cockpit. Hey lady, hey baby, hey. Why don't you grab us a drink? And the flight attendants weren't my friends back then. And they said, are you better than us, do you think? But I can't get. Come From Away runs through July 28th. That's going to do it for us for this morning. The State of Ohio with Karen Kassler is up next. I'm Rick Jackson. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Brought to you by Westfield, offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams.